The Legal Tender Cases, 1871. Knox against Lee and Parker against Davis. These are the facts. The Legal Tender Acts, passed in 1862, made paper money, popularly called greenbacks, legal currency for the payment of public and private debts. The federal government needed money. The cost of the Civil War was an enormous drain on the Treasury, and the credit of the government was at a low ebb. The army in the field was unpaid. Expenditures for supplies and equipment exceeded a million dollars per day. Urgently pressed for funds, the government issued millions in greenbacks to finance the cost of war. The constitutionality of the Legal Tender Acts was not challenged in the Supreme Court until 1870. The emergency of wartime had passed, and it was to the advantage of debtors to have the acts upheld, so that pre-war debts contracted for in gold could be repaid in depreciated paper money. Powerful creditor interests, such as banks and mortgage holders, opposed the act. At the time the first legal tender case was argued, the Supreme Court was limited to eight justices because in 1866, Congress had passed an act preventing President Johnson from filling Supreme Court vacancies. When President Grant took office in 1869, Congress removed the limitation and at the same time expanded the court to nine justices. Justice Greer, whose last vote on the court had been cast against the constitutionality of the Legal Tender Acts, retired. And President Grant nominated two new justices to fill the vacancies. Both men, William Strong and Joseph Bradley, were known to favor strong national government. The decision in the first Legal Tender case, Hepburn against Griswold, decided while Justice Greer was on the court was not handed down until after his retirement, and the new justices were confirmed by the Senate. Fifteen months later, after an intense, secret, internal struggle, the court decided five to four to reopen the legal tender question, a decision severely criticized by those who felt that it was improper for the court to rehear an issue so recently settled by the then full court. The argument by the attorney for the appellants. May it please the court. No power has been expressly given Congress by the Constitution to make Treasury notes legal tender. If such power exists at all, it must be implied from other authority. The power given to Congress to coin money and regulate the value thereof, the power to punish counterfeiting, the restrictions on the power of the states to make anything but gold and silver coin a legal tender, all combine to establish that the government has no power to make any legal tender except the coin it strikes. The record of the Constitutional Convention, the commentary of the framers of the Constitution, and the debates of the state conventions that adopted it, all fail to establish that the power to make bills of credit a legal tender was given to the federal government. It is asserted that the power is necessary and proper to carry into effect some one or more of the powers delegated to Congress by the Constitution. The meaning of this clause was long ago settled by Chief Justice Marshall in McCulloch against Maryland, who held that all means to a legitimate end that are appropriate and plainly adapted to that end, and which are not expressly prohibited, and are consistent with the letter and spirit of the Constitution, are constitutional and legal. It is contended that exercise of the legal tender power was necessary to enable the government to borrow money to carry on the war and to maintain its very existence. No such necessity existed. The business of the country was done in unredeemed bank paper and in treasury notes, which were not legal tender. Never was national wealth so great or private debt so reduced. Further, security of the notes 
was not increased by the legal tender clause, since without it, the notes still had whatever security the full faith and credit of the government would give them. There was neither necessity nor appropriateness in the use of the legal tender power. For these reasons, and for those reasons for which it was so recently struck down in Hepburn against Griswold, the legal tender acts are clearly unconstitutional. The opinion of the court by Mr. Justice Strong. It would be difficult to overestimate the consequences which must follow our decision. They will affect the entire business of the country and take hold of the possible continued existence of the government. If it is held that Congress has no constitutional power in any emergency to make Treasury notes a legal tender for the payment of all debts, the government will be without an indispensable means of self-preservation. When investigating the nature and extent of the powers conferred by the Constitution on Congress, it is indispensable to keep in view the objects for which these powers were granted. These powers must be regarded as related to each other, and all means for a common end which was to establish a government sovereign within its sphere with capability of self-preservation, thereby forming a more perfect union. The same may be asserted of all the non-enumerated powers given to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the specified powers vested in Congress. It is impossible to know what those non-enumerated powers are without considering the purposes they were intended to serve. It was certainly intended to confer upon the government the power of self-preservation. What were the circumstances in which this country was placed when Congress made Treasury notes legal tender? Civil war was raging. To equip and support the large army and navy employed money to an extent beyond ordinary resources. The public treasury was nearly empty. The army unpaid. We say nothing of the paralysis of trade which reacted to the loss of public confidence in the ability of the government to continue in existence. Money was essential for the preservation of the government created by the Constitution. If these enactments did work results, can it be maintained now that they were not for a legitimate end or appropriate and adapted to that end? Those who assert the unconstitutionality of the acts claim that the clause which conferred upon Congress power to coin money and regulate the value thereof contained an implication that nothing but that which is the subject of coinage can ever be declared by law to be money or to have the uses of money. We reply that the grant cannot be regarded as containing an implied limitation against the legal tender power of the sovereign, since prohibition of sovereign powers are specific in the Constitution, and if the grant raises any implications, they are of a complete federal power over currency. We next come to the argument that the acts are prohibited by the spirit of the Constitution because they directly impair the obligation of contracts. The obligation of a contract to pay money is to pay that which the law shall recognize as money when the payment is to be made. Every contract is subject to the constitutional power of a currency and the obligation of the parties is assumed with reference to that power. Unless otherwise specified, they are engagements to pay in the lawful money of the United States, and Congress is empowered to regulate that money. It cannot be maintained, therefore, that the legal tender acts impaired the obligations of contracts. Closely allied to the objection just considered, is the argument that the legal tender acts were prohibited by the spirit of the Fifth Amendment, which forbids taking private property for public use 
without just compensation or due process of law. That provision has always been understood as referring only to a direct appropriation and not to consequential injuries resulting from the exercise of lawful power. It has never been supposed to have any bearing upon or to inhibit laws that indirectly work harm and loss on individuals. Therefore, we hold the Acts of Congress constitutional as applied to contracts made either before or after their passage. In so holding, we overrule so much of what was decided in Hepburn against Griswold as rule the acts unwarranted by the Constitution so far as they applied to contracts made before their enactment. These opinions expressed a strong nationalism that gave a broad construction to the powers of the federal government under the Constitution. Thirteen years later, in the case of Juilliard against Greenman, the court upheld as constitutional the power to make Treasury notes legal tender in time of peace as well as war.